We gather to worship the Lord our God, to worship in spirit, in spirit and in truth. Let us pray. God, thank you for creating us in your image, to be loved by you even when being dehumanized helps us to see others through the lens of love, so we can value and honor your creation. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Welcome to the Christ United Presbyterian Church a Christian church that stands within the Presbyterian family of churches. It's good to see everyone. Just a few announcements as we continue in worship this morning. Uh, number one, um, I don't know how your week went, but uh, last night my car died. So, Sean, if you're willing to give uh, the preacher and his daughter a ride home, um, <laughs> I'm hoping that's possible. I know you have the space if you drove your van. We just need a little in the back, you know. We just need a little space in the back, brother. So, um, so that's on my mind. So I'm glad I'm uh, not uh, delivering the word today because there might be some bad words that come out. But uh, we have Sheila uh, delivering the word today. And I've heard Sheila preach about three times at the San Diego Rescue Mission. And so that's, uh, that's been a joy, and she is a ruling elder, duly elected in this congregation. And most of all, and she'll remind you that she is a daughter of the king. So we get to hear from a daughter of the king. And our translation of the Holy Scriptures will be a little bit different this week. We will be using, for our scripture readings, the New King James Version of the Bible. And you'll see the New King James Version up here, and you'll also hear it. And when I say up here, I mean on the screens. Let's uh, continue in worship. Let's continue in worship, hearing, O Thou in whose presence.
Jesus loves us and frees us. Therefore, let us come before God confessing where we have fallen short. We share in our prayer of confession as it appears on our screens. Holy God, how often we trust in the promises of earthly rulers instead of the power of your love. Help us to turn our hearts toward you, restore us in your love, and set us free to forgive as we have been forgiven. By the grace and mercy of Christ, amen. Sisters and brothers, God loves us, forgives us, and frees us from our sins. Therefore, be at peace. Let us sing. Good morning, church. A congressional, (laughs) gosh, a congregation meeting will take place November 28th after the service of the Lord. The nominating committee will present its slate of officers. Pulpit assistants have their training December 11th at 10 a.m. Elders and diggins will have their training December 11th at 11.30. Presbyterian Women's Bible Study will take place each fourth Sunday. I will be reading Exodus 33.17 to 34.7 from the New King James Version. So the Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing that you have spoken, for you have found grace in my sight, and I know you by name. And he said, Please show me your glory. Then he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will, I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and live. And the Lord said, here is a place by me, and you shall stand on the rock. So it shall be, while my glory passes by, that I will put you in a cleft of the rock and will cover you with my hand while I pass by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back. My face shall not be seen. Moses makes the tablets. And the Lord said to Moses, 
cut two tablets of stone like the first ones, and I will write on these tablets the words that were on the first tablets which you broke. So be ready in the morning, come up in the morning to Mount Sinai, and present yourself to me there on top of the mountain. And no man shall come with you, and let no man be seen throughout the mountain. Let neither flocks nor herds feed before that mountain. So he cut the two tablets of stone like the first ones. Then Moses rose early in the morning and went up Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him. And he took in his hands the two tablets of stone. Now the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. Holy wisdom, holy word. Here's a poem called The Presence of God by Benjamin Anna Baraoni. Live in God's presence, experience his blessings, the great joy of knowing he's by your side, his grace amazing and peace fascinating. His love so high, so deep, so wide. Live in God's presence, experience his friendship, 
the sweet fellowship offered by his spirit, his hand to keep and hold you, least you slip, his voice to cheer, to let you know you can make it. Live in God's presence, experience his mercy, his word to guide you each step of the way, forgiveness, freedom by the blood shed on Calvary, enter his presence, the moment you begin to pray. Good morning, church. Good morning. Psalm 103, verses 8 through 14. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. For he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. I would like to clarify first that I'm not a preacher, I'm a teacher, and there's a difference which you will see. I take a portion of scripture and I dig into it to see what all is hidden in those words. So that's what we're going to do today. We're gonna to dig into Exodus 33 and 34, and we're gonna use Psalm 103 to enlighten that a little bit. Okay, so the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. Just the way I'm standing here talking to you today, 
That's how God and Moses spoke to each other. And you can do that too. It's called prayer, which is just a fancy word for conversation with God. God speaks to you through his word, through the Holy Spirit, through that still, small voice. All you have to do is listen. And all you have to do to pray, to talk to God, is open your mouth or your heart, your mind. You can converse with God. In these verses, we see that God doesn't just know Moses' name. He knows him by name. He knows Moses intimately. He knows the thoughts of his heart. He knows what motivates Moses. He created Moses and shaped him for the job that he has for him to take the children. Um, they have a personal relationship. And we have that same personal relationship with God through our relationship with Jesus Christ. So we see that Moses has found grace in God's sight. Grace is unmerited favor. You can't earn it. You can't buy it. It's a free gift. It's the unearned kindness that God shows each one of us. Moses confronts God and says, show me your way. Why, why does he want to know God's way? God's telling him what to do. But he wants more than that. He wants to know why God is doing what he is doing so that he can understand God better. And he says that I may know you. He wants God to let him know what he's doing and why so he can understand him and act accordingly. The better understanding we have of God's will for us, the better we're able to fulfill his will and his purpose for our lives. And by the way, Moses reminds God, keep in mind that you chose this nation and they're your people. Have you ever noticed in all the years in the wilderness how whenever God's displeased with the children of Israel, he turns to Moses and says, your people whom you brought out of Egypt. It reminds me of when my kids were little and when they were doing really good things, they were my kids, look what my kid did. But if they were awful that day, when Arvel got home, he heard, do you know what your kids did today? <laughs> And anybody who has kids, I'm sure, can relate to that. But we're made in God's image, right? So we have an excuse for it. Okay. So then God says to Moses, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Well, wait a minute. God's presence is always with us, isn't it? Is there any place that you can go to get away from God's presence? Psalm 139 says there's nothing. There's nowhere you can go to get away from God's presence. So why does God say... My presence will go with you. Well, if you look up the meaning of the words, the word that's translated presence is panim in the Hebrew, which means face. And what he's saying is, I will keep my face turned towards you. I will not turn my back on you. And that little word rest is nuach, which implies a place of quietude, a place of habitation, a place of comfort and restoration. And God's presence brings that to us. We have new, we have a place of rest in Jesus. So then Moses says again, if your presence does not go with us, don't bring us up from here. He's arguing that they need God's presence to establish their identity and to separate them from all others. It is God's spirit dwelling in you that establishes your identity as the child of God. And it's God's spirit dwelling in you that sets apart, you apart from non-believers. It's not going to church. It's not carrying around a big Bible. It's God's living presence in you through the Holy Spirit that separates you from all others. So Moses said, please show me your glory. Now Moses already spent 40 days and 40 nights on that mountaintop alone with God. What more does he want? He says, show me your glory. What does the word glory mean? Can you describe the glory of God? Well, when the angel appeared to the shepherds to announce Jesus' birth, it says, the, the book of Luke says, the, the glory of the Lord shone around them. So obviously it's light, but it's not just light. The word glory actually means manifestation. And it's exposing something clearly and unmistakably. So the glory of God 
is the clear and unmistakable, weighty, splendid, copious manifestation of God's character, of everything that God is. And that's what Moses wants. Show me your glory. He's not content with talking to God face to face. He wants to know the essential godness of God, the character, the essence of who God is. Don't you ever feel that hunger, ever have that craving to know God more intimately than you do? That's what Moses is asking for. So God says, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. He says, I will make all my goodness pass before you. Goodness is just the simple word tov. And it's not just the essence of being good, but it's the best. So God's going to make his bestness, if that's a word, it's not a word, but I made it up. His bestness passed before Moses. He's going to show Moses the pure, unadulterated goodness of God in every aspect of his character. I mean, he's going to make this pass before Moses. And also God says he will be gracious to whom he will be gracious and he will have mercy on whom he will have mercy. As God's sovereign choice. He does not have to be gracious to you. He does not have to show you mercy. He does those things because it's part of his character. It's part of his glory. He chooses to be gracious to you and to show mercy to you. And it's for his glory. And then he says to Moses, here is a place by me, and you shall stand on the rock. God provides a place for us next to him. But we have to take our stand on the rock. And who is our rock? It's Jesus. Now, is that far-fetched to say this rock is Jesus? No, because 1 Corinthians 10.4, talking about the children of Israel in the wilderness, says they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock is Christ. So God provides the place. You have to take your stand. And God goes on, so it shall be while my glory passes by that I will put you in the cleft of the rock and will cover you with my hand while I pass by. The cleft in the rock is a fissure. It's a crack. It's a broken place. Jesus Christ, our rock, was broken for us. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace is upon him, and by his stripes we are healed, Isaiah 53. It's in this broken place that we find wholeness and healing. We take our stand on the rock, who is Christ. God puts us in the cleft of the rock, in that broken place. And then he covers them with his hand. Now, the palm of the hand is actually a very intimate part of the body. In a lot of cultures, people don't shake hands. That's too intimate a gesture. And I, I worked years ago, I, I worked quite a few years at the Jewish Community Center. And one day, a, an Orthodox rabbi came in to meet with our director. And I was his secretary, so I happened to be there. I was introduced to him and not knowing any, I should have known better, but I didn't. I looked him straight in the eye and stuck my hand out. And I knew immediately I'd done something wrong from the look of abject horror on his face and the way he took a step backwards and put his hands behind his back. Um, an Orthodox Jewish man would never touch a woman that he was not a close relative, much less shake hands with her, much less with a shiksa like me. Um, but it's when God covered Moses with the palm of his hand, it was a very intimate gesture. And at the same time, the hand of God symbolizes power and might and authority. So there's strength in that. It's an intimate place, but there's strength in it. Are you in that intimate place today, covered by the hand of God? Then in Exodus 34, we go on, and God fulfills Moses fulfills what he told Moses he would do in chapter 33. So Moses is now hidden in the cleft of the rock. He's covered by the hand of God. God comes down in a cloud and stands with him there and proclaims the name of the Lord. <coughs> 
So God called out his name. What is God's name? This is a teaching moment. What is God's name? I am. I am. I am is the essence of who God is all rolled into one. Do you need healing? God says, I am your healer. Do you need food on your table? God says, I am your provider. Do you need salvation? God says, I am your redeemer. Are you in tumult and chaos? God says, I am your peace. That I am covers everything God is. <coughs> Excuse me. So proclaim means to call out. It also means to encounter. So Moses is encountering God in an intimate place and proclaiming his name, I am. And then he begins to describe himself. The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth. In the Hebrew, this passage uses the name that God had proclaimed at the burning bush. So where our translation reads, the Lord, the Lord God, the Hebrew literally says, I am, I am God. So he's saying in this passage, I am merciful. I am gracious, I am long-suffering, I am abounding in good. Not I was, not I will be, but I am right now, today, where you are in your place of need. God says, I am. So he's merciful. He has compassion. That word literally means to caress or to fondle like you would a small child, a baby. You know how you hold a baby in your arms and you, that's what God does with us. That's what that mercy means. It's a hands-on kind of love. It, it means to compassionate or to feel pity for. I am gracious. We know grace is unmerited favor. To be gracious is to stoop down in kindness to meet someone right where they are, like a parent with a child. And God bends down to Moses, to where Moses is, He's stooped to Moses' level in kindness. And when God gives you grace, that's what he's doing. He's coming down to where you are at that moment in time and bestowing his grace on you in kindness. He says, I am long-suffering. He's patient. You know how much he puts up with. I know how much he puts up with in my life. Multiply that by all of us and by everybody else around. His long-suffering, patient love for you is what drew you to him in the first place and what brought you to salvation. He says, I am abounding in goodness. That word abounding is abundance. It's not just the amount, but it's the quality of his goodness. His kindness, his favor, his mercy is great. It abounds. It is more than sufficient for all your needs. And so is his truth. Emmet. The word means stability. God's truth is solid, unchanging, and dependable. The fact of God is unchanging. It gives us certainty. He's trustworthy. Psalm 103 expands a little bit on some of these meanings. Um, verse 8 gives us an example of long-suffering. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in mercy. Verse 9 shows us forgiving. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. Verse 10, merciful. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. You know the difference between grace and mercy? Grace is God giving us what we don't deserve. Mercy is not giving us what we do deserve. That was for free. That's not in my notes. So going back to Exodus, God forgives iniquity and transgression and sin. Does that sound repetitious, redundant? It's not. And I noticed our modern translations in that verse say, God forgives all kinds of sin. Well, that, okay, I'm not gonna say any more about modern translation. Okay, so iniquity and transgression and sin. Iniquity is the innate tendency to crookedness. It's from a root word that means to crook or to make crooked. And it's the sin we're born with. We're born in sin, let's face it. And we talk about how pure and, you know, kids are, they're pure. 
Well, they're not. A child is born the most totally self-centered person on earth. He wants to be fed, he wants to be changed, he wants to be held. Life is all about him, and some people never outgrow that, but th that's kind of beside, that's, that's the sin nature we were born with. That's, that's sin in this tra in the scripture. Transgression is rebellion. It's a rejection of God's purpose for your life. It's living a life that is not God-pleasing. That, that's a rejection of everything God has for you. It, it's rebellion. A sin is the lie you just told, the piece of gum you palmed at the 7-Eleven when you were a kid, that little bit of juicy gossip you just couldn't help passing on. Uh, maybe it's the feeling of the smugness because you're better looking than the person sitting next to you. Um, it, it's, you know that feeling you have when somebody cuts you off on the freeway? That little bit of rage, that's a sin. Okay, if you, it's just a single thing. If you dwell on, if you continue in it, it will turn into transgression. If you confess it, what does God do? First John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But it's your choice. We all sin. We do it all, we probably do it on a day, I do it on a daily basis. I don't mean to, but God brings it to my attention when I do it. And if I confess it, I'm good. If I persist in it, it will turn into transgression. So those three words, sin, iniquity, and transgression cover everything that's wrong in your life. And God forgives all of them. He says, Psalm 30, or Exodus 34, 7, God forgives iniquity and transgression and sin. You just have to go to him with it. The same verse says he keeps mercy for thousands. So going again to Psalm 103, 11, for as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards those who fear him. How far is it from earth to heaven? Can you even measure it? Verse 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. How far is it from east to west? Can you measure that? Verse 17, but the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children. How long is everlasting? God's mercy lasts from eternity to eternity. It will never cease. It is part of who he is, part of his character, his glory, his personality, and he does not change. Malachi 3, 6, I am God, I change not. So are you standing today in that place that God made for you? Are you hidden in the cleft of the rock with him, covered by his hand? Is your life now hidden in Christ with God? May the glory of God, his mercy, his grace, his patience, his goodness, his truth, and his forgiveness be with you now and all the days of your life. Amen. Amen. It takes a lot of courage to stand up here, and uh, none of us are qualified to do it. So when uh, someone hears the call to do it, uh, we, we acknowledge uh, responding to the call. Uh, we continue in worship now in a posture of prayer. Let us pray. Uh, God, storehouse and distributor of love. You have promised to remain forever with your people. Help us to live in your presence, to trust in your presence, to witness to your presence. The loving plan of your wisdom has the loving plan of your wisdom was made known when Jesus, your son, became a human being like us. He gets us. He understands us. 
May we in response love one another and bring your peace and joy to others. Keep before us the wisdom and love you have made known in your Son. Help us to be like him in word and deed. Make us prayer warriors, Lord. Make us care warriors. Make us study warriors. We pray that you look out for the Moore family, that you comfort Ida in her pain. We remember Gunny. Uh, blessings on Harold Carr and so many others who claim your name. Lord, have mercy. We pray for peace between warring nations, peace between battling ideologies, and peace in our hearts. Lord God, have mercy. Lord God, hear the prayers of your people. Hear us as we pray, as we have been taught to pray, as we join our voices praying together with strength. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We continue in worship sharing of our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings. to the Lord. Holy God, you call us from every tribe, language, people, and nation to share in your everlasting kingdom. Bless these gifts that we offer, that we may extend your blessing to others. In Christ's name we pray. 
Amen. Lord be kind and gracious to you. 